Sabbath. Yikes. Ooh. Not that loud. Better? Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our song service by singing hymn number 618, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. song is hymn 272. 272 is Give Me the Bible.
I'm standing up here and none of you know what I'm looking at. There's a little baby Jesus up here from when Shirley gave the children's story. And I loved it so much because I loved how she said that Jesus could always be with you. And we know that, but it's a great visual for children to know that Jesus is always with you. Our next song that we're going to sing is Just a Closer Walk with Thee. I was going to say it's in our Adventist youth sing, so... Sabbath, everyone. Okay. Welcome to Metropolitan Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're grateful for everyone being here, and you honor us with your presence, and of course, we're all honored to have the Lord Jesus Christ in our midst as well. That's the ultimate honor. I'd like to, first of all, are there any visitors that are amongst us here? I'd like to recognize any visitors. Yes? Well... Not quite, <laughs> but welcome. We appreciate having you, and uh, may God bless you and keep you in all that you say and do. I have a couple announcements to make, and there's going to be some other ones that we'll call, call people in turn. One is to um, remember that um, potluck is not today, but yet potluck is today. That doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, so our usual potluck is not today. But um, there's been enough food that's been brought um, that I understand that we can have visitors, that if there's any visitor that would like to stay by and uh, join us with uh, uh, some food, we have some food available for you. So let's just call it a visitor's potluck is, is available. It's not the biggest potluck, but there's enough. So please feel free to stay by for that. Also want to highlight the fact that there's going to be an investiture on May Fourth, both for the Pathfinders and for the Adventurers. 
we want to go and we want to make sure that we support that. Also want to mention that April 26 through 7 is going to be um, the ASI Lake Union Spring Fellowship. Some of you may have received the handout. Please keep that handout. It looks like we're going to have a wonderful time here. We're going to have various speakers, including um, Michigan Conference own Vicki Griffin, but also Ivor Myers and Clavel Hunter. So um, there's programs on the Friday evening and as well as the Sabbath. So if I were you, I look forward to coming. And with that, I'd like to call a couple people to give some other announcements. Will Matt please come? Okay. Happy Sabbath, Church. Happy Sabbath. Uh, the Metro Rangers would like to thank all of you for your generous support throughout the year. Because of your donation and patronage of our efforts, we get the opportunity to attend the International Campery. This is something that we have been looking forward to for years, and God has used all of you for it to make it possible for us to enjoy such a rare opportunity. In addition, the Metro Rangers Pathfinder Club will be having their investiture service here at 7 p.m. on May 4th. This is the time when the Pathfinder are individually recognized for all that they have accomplished and learned throughout the previous year. This, this includes study and activities pertaining to the Word of God, community service, and survival and vocational skills. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call, call Brother Roy to come and give an announcement. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, as you know, the ladies have a women's meal every month, and we're going to have a man's meal every month. Um, if anyone is desiring, I'd like to see you in the all-purpose room after church to get a count of how many people would be willing, because we can make it happen this week if we would like or we'll plan it for the following week. But I'd like to have you come over after church in the fellowship hall so we can discuss what we'll do with that. Thank you, I'd like to call Camille to give a I mean, an announcement. Camille? Okay, maybe she's busy. Um, Pastor? I can give Camille a few more minutes because I have a few things I want to talk to you about. Um, we had a church business meeting this week. Uh, many of you were there, so you know what I'm going to say. But uh, for those of you that don't, we have been talking about our parking lot and our garage. Now, when you drive in, you'll notice our parking lot. Um, and the first thing you'll see, you know, is a church and school. But then the last thing you might notice is our garage, which we would like to... Um, to make it look a little nicer. Um, I want to say that God has really blessed our church. Uh, not just this year, as you look around, you know, we had major flood damage and everything in here is almost brand new. If not brand new, then recently refinished. These over the last 12 years are the projects that we have been able to do together and I haven't been here for 12 years, so m many of you know this better than I do. The, uh, the projects started with the organ restoration and ended in 2023 with insulation in the attic to prevent future pipe breaks so that we can avoid, hopefully, any more floods. The total for all of these projects represents, I think, one of the great blessings that God has given us is the ability to do $830,000 worth of upgrades to our church and maintenance. Um, that's what this represents, about $830,000 in uh, investment to, but that's a blessing from the Lord that he is able to do that here. And so um, if you are ready for it, we're going to move on to the next project, and that is to resurface our parking lot 
because as you can see on the screen, it is time. Um, if you drive over it, you probably don't feel like it's too bad because you're not driving around potholes. You're not uh, worried about your tires every time you come here. But if you do take a look at it, you'll notice that it's been wearing away. This is the original parking lot. It's uh, over 40 years old. We've got good use out of it. So um, we're going to uh, embark on a journey together to, um, to pay for this. Now, I'll put the next uh, slide on the screen here, and you'll see that the total cost of this project is $336,000. Um, this includes moving the garage back about 70 feet or so and making some bigger space for the school to have uh, their field, their, their ball field, their soccer field, to make that a little bit bigger. And, uh, and so that's the total cost for the parking lot and the garage. But we have $183,000 already towards this project, uh, which means we can apply for the Lake Union Revolving Fund loan, but we need to pay for the other half, and so we're seeking to raise $153,000 over the next short term, few months. We want this driveway done during camp meeting. Camp meeting is such a great time because most people are gone to camp meeting. And, uh, and when we come back from camp meeting, you will see a beautiful new parking lot. So we are in uh, the, the fundraising stages. If the Lord has put it on your heart that you'd like to give, you can just mark the parking lot garage fund. Um, you can donate specifically to the parking lot or specifically to the garage. Um, you can donate to both of them in general. It's up to you, however you, the Lord moves on your heart. But we want to raise $153,000 in the next few months, or at least as much as we can, and we'll keep that loan uh, as low as possible so that it can be paid off as soon as possible. That's the goal. So that's uh, all I want to say at the moment for, uh, for that. But I just want you to know that God has truly blessed our church with some tremendous people and generous givers. At over the last 12 years, we've got a, a wonderful facility, a wonderful campus that we have. Um, I also want to tell you that the organizing committee met and we have selected a list of names for the nominating committee that you can see up on the screen. The nominating committee meets and they are the ones that uh, go through the church officer list for the next two year term and they bring a list of names for you to vote on. And so these are the, the people that we have chosen as a committee to serve and we would like to put this to a, a vote for you if this is okay. Um, I just invite you to raise your hand as a show of support for the people listed here. And if there are people who are against the names that are listed here, you can sheepishly raise your hand or confidently. Um, so that's, that's something that we like to do. We'd like to get that started soon so that we can present this um, well before camp meeting starts and have time for uh, a transition period. So then this will be the nominating committee. Thank you for your help. And now I'd like to invite... Uh, Debbie to come on up. Debbie Young is our ASI representative here, a friend of mine that I've known for a long time, and she's going to share with us uh, what ASI is coming to do in two weeks. Thank you very much, Pastor Dan, and good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Um, if you don't have a flyer that you might have received that is in your bulletin, um, maybe the deacons might be able to, if you raise your hand, that they can bring out and give you one, because I'd like you to be able to um, read along as I give you this information. So I, my name is Debbie Young, and I appreciate very much, Pastor Dan, the opportunity to give a little bit more information about what you can expect in two weeks on April 26 and 27. The ASI Lake Union Spring Fellowship is held every spring before the ASI International Convention, which is held in August, July, end of July, beginning of August. And we are thrilled that Metro has consented to host our event. For those of you who may not be familiar with ASI, ASI stands for Adventist Layman's Services and Industries, and it's an organization of Seventh-day Adventist lay people who operate businesses or ministries and live by the motto, sharing Christ in the marketplace. Because we recognize that God has called all of us to be ministers and sharers of the gospel, regardless of where we are, in every facet of our lives, we should be taking the opportunity 
opportunity to share Christ with others. So we want to um, bring that information, the, the wonderful experience and fellowship that we enjoy every year here to Metro, and know that you will be blessed by that. Our theme, as it indicates on the flyer, is community, Enge encouraged, empowered, engaged. And I was just struck by the Sabbath school discussion this morning when we talked about the importance of community and how the um, early believers came together and they were a community that were focused and their purpose was to be able to let people know about Jesus Christ. So we want to do that in our, that weekend. It will begin at 3 p.m. On, on Friday afternoon with seminars, as was mentioned, with Vicki Griffin and Pastor Clavel Hunter, and you will definitely want to, to participate in that. It, was, it will be very exciting. Our keynote speaker is coming from Huntsville, Alabama, Ivor Myers, and we're thrilled that he will be here on Friday evening. He will speak for this church worship service as well as Sabbath evening vespers. For Sabbath school, we will have a vigorous discussion, panel discussion, moderated by your very own Gil Chapman, so we're looking forward to that. We also have children's program planned for Friday evening as well as Sabbath afternoon in addition to the regular uh, children's programs you have, and we want to thank so much Rula for being willing to assist us with that process. Um, so I wanted to let you know that it's not too late to register. And the information is on that flyer, as well as we do have registration forms. I did bring some, so they are out in the foyer if you wanted to take one of those, or there is the website address where you could register for that. And the registration, you will ask, well, what is that different? I'll be here for church, but if you want to participate in the seminars and the Friday evening and the Sabbath evening meetings and um, the meals that would be provided on Friday evening and Sabbath evening, as well as receive a wonderful registration package that we have for each registrant that will have some great evangelism and witnessing tools, that is what registration will provide for you. So um, there are some ways, different ways and uh, costs for the registration, so you have a little bit of choice on how you do that, but we want to encourage you because we want you to take advantage of the seminars, especially because they will provide equipping ideas for us to be able to share Christ with others. So it's not too late to register. I know it's just two weeks away, but you can still take care of that and and we would be thrilled to have you join us. So this ASI event is not just for ASI members. We want to encourage visitors and others to come so they can learn more about ASI and how they can be better and more effective witnesses in their area of influence. So we want to, as the, our theme says, be a community that's not only encouraged, empowered, and engaged, but we want to be equipped to serve the master better. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you. I will be here after church for a while, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those at that time. Happy Sabbath. Good morning, Metro Church. I'm so glad she mentioned community. God put that on my heart this morning. Uh, I'm announcing AY, gym night, next Sabbath. There's a lot of research behind the importance and the blessing of community. When you come together and you have that sense of belonging, that you're not alone in this world, we live longer. There's an awesome documentary on Netflix, some of you may have watched it, uh, The Blue Zones. And that's one of the things that makes centurions in this world, <laughs> makes people live longer, is that sense of belonging. We all need each other. We're not meant to do life alone. So next Sabbath, we're going to have uh, one of our last AYs, well, gym nights, I should say, because in the summer we can still get together. But gym night will have volleyball uh, and basketball, but before that we're going to have some worship, some music, some food, um, Bible trivia, and some fun with each other's company, and most importantly, why we're all here, to learn more about Jesus, right, to draw near to him and to grow in our faith, until he comes again. God bless you. Have a blessed Sabbath.
Our call to worship will be taken from Psalm 33, verse 1. Psalms 33, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word.
At this time, I invite you to join me in prayer. Happy Sabbath, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for your love and your watch care over us over the past week. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for the abundant blessings that you shower upon us every day. Thank you for life and health and strength. Thank you for a world in which we can see the beauties of nature despite the wickedness of man. Thank you for all that you have done to preserve us and the hedge that you've placed around us so graciously that's protected us so wonderfully, Lord. We're grateful for all of this and much, much more. Lord, you have called us at a moment such as this, not only to worship you, but also to speak for you well, not speak for you, but speak through you. As you give us the words to express, help us, Lord, to go and take those words, just like we sang about a few moments ago, into a world where there's lots of despair, hopelessness, lots of people concerned, not knowing whether to go, hither, thither, or yon, moving about. Lord, you've, we're in a world where there's lots of confusion. We're in a world that needs the clarity of your truth, as we find in the Bible. So, Lord, help us to proclaim your truth and to proclaim the messages that you've given us, including the three angels' messages. Lord, we have sickness in our midst. We have sadness in our midst. We have discouragement in our midst. And we need you to apply the balm of Gilead upon all of these and heal and touch and encourage and strengthen. So please, Lord, not for our sake, but for your own, please touch your children even now and heal your children. Lord, we pray that as your speaker, your manservant, Pastor McGrath, will soon address us, please take a coal from the altar of heaven and place it upon his lips, that he may speak words that won't just resonate with our minds, but will touch our hearts and draw us closer to you. We need a a word from you, Lord, and we trust that we will get it very soon. In the meanwhile, Lord, as we sing songs, as we pray, as we hear children's stories, we just pray that everything will honor and glorify your name. The worthy name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Now it's time for our children's story. I believe um, Auntie Stacy is going to be giving the message. I know the kids are looking forward to that. We see them piling on in. Please give liberally as um, the offering that will be collected is for our church school.
keeping it. Okay. I can see that. That's some good Velcro on there. Yes. You want to see? Okay, happy Sabbath, boys and girls. I just have a couple questions. Who had dinner last night? Okay, I see a few. You didn't have dinner. Oh, okay. Did you have dinner last night? Did you have dinner last night, Charlie? You didn't have dinner? I'm going to talk to your parents and see what's going on with that. Who had breakfast this morning? Breakfast? 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 Who had a good breakfast? Really, let's, let's go walk over here and find out what they had for breakfast. What did you have for breakfast? Noodles. Noodles? I love that kind of breakfast. What did you have? Toast with cream and, and, and with yeast flakes. Oh, she had a really healthy breakfast. Did you have breakfast this morning? What did you have? Eggs and rice. Eggs and rice. Oh, I remember that as a kid. What did you have? I had nothing. You didn't have breakfast? Okay, we'll talk to your parents too. <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? Pancakes. Ooh, that was a great breakfast. Ian, what did you have for breakfast? Peanut butter and honey. Peanut butter and honey, yummy. What did you have, Ryan? Toast and eggs. Toast and eggs? Ooh, that sounds delicious. Bagel, bagels and eggs. Bagels and eggs. Ooh, that sounds good. What did you have, Charlie? Cereal. Cereal. Okay. Emma, what did you have? Cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon. Emma had cinnamon rolls. I would take some of those, too. I would take some of all of that. Do you want to tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? Okay, no, she doesn't want anybody to know her breakfast of choice. So I want to ask another question. Do we think all little boys and girls eat breakfast every day? Do we think boys and girls eat breakfast every day? No. Why? Huh? You haven't? Oh, you has? Yes. But there are some little boys and girls that don't get to eat breakfast. Some of them don't even get to eat dinner. But I want to tell you about a little boy named Frank who was only seven years old, and he would always want to help everybody. He would see people on the street, and he would ask his mom and dad, could he give them a water, or could he give them a dollar, or anything like that. And then one day, Frank had this great idea, and he said, I want to pray for every little boy and girl at my school, and every day I want to bring a snack or bring something just in case someone doesn't have any food. So Frank talked this idea over with his mom and dad because they would be the ones providing the extra snacks. And every day he would pray. If somebody needed an extra snack or if somebody didn't have food, that he wanted to have extra. And every day he would give someone an apple or an orange or whatever little snack. And then he asked his mom one day, he was like, Mom, can you make me two sandwiches? I want two lunches. And she was like, do you know someone that needs a lunch? He didn't know anyone, but he had been praying, and he said he wanted to pray and ask God to show him who needed a lunch. And so his mom said, okay. She packed him an extra sandwich. He had an extra orange. He had an extra bag of chips. And without the else kind of snacks you guys may like, he had an extra one. So he had just been praying, praying, and praying. And that day when he went to school, he seen a little boy sitting in the cafeteria by himself. And Frank said, let me go over there and sit with him. And he asked the little boy, he was like, why are you by yourself? Why are you sad? He said, because my mom did not remember to pack me a lunch today. 
And it was such a blessing to Frank because he had been praying that somebody would need an extra lunch. And so Frank was able to share his lunch, share his snack. He gave the little boy the same thing he had. And so he was so excited he couldn't wait to get home to tell his mom and dad how God had answered his prayers. Do we think God hears prayers? Do we think God answers prayers? Yes, so we have to always pray and know that God hears them and will answer them. Who wants to pray for us today? Anybody? You said not me? I like that. So let, <laughs> let's just say a word of prayer. Dear most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us food to eat and food to share, Lord. I ask that you help us to remember that we can pray and ask you for anything because you do hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now is our time to worship through giving. Today's offering will be for the Hope Channel International. Hope Channel does a fantastic work. It's among other outlets that we have as in our church that promote the Three Angels messages, along with others like 3BN, Amazing Facts, It Is Written. Hope Channel does a, a special work, and we want to encourage that. So, if it's within your means and your desire, please give liberally to Hope Channel International. Let's bow heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the media outlets that you've given us as a church. While it's important for us to have door-to-door -door and friend-to-friend -friend ministries, we know that some people will be reached only through media. And so Lord, while media is being used in wrong ways by others. We're grateful that media is used the right way amongst us. So help us to use the media that you've given us to get your three angels' messages out to the whole world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Dazan, thank you for the beautiful music. I invite you to join me in your Bibles as we read John chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. John chapter 16, reading verses 12 through 14. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For whatever he hears, he will speak. Sorry, excuse me. For he will not speak of, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Good morning. If you would uh, stand up and shake someone's hand next to you, tell them that you're going to pray for them this week and mean it.
All right, that gave me enough time to find my spot here, open my notes, and get ready for the sermon. Thank you. I hope that uh, you have already received a blessing from being here. If, uh, if not, come and speak to me afterwards, and we'll chat. But uh, I think it's good that God has invited us to come into his presence and that we responded to that invitation to be here to worship the Lord. I invite you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, it's our prayer that right now you would speak to us. You have promised that for those who come together that you would be in our midst and we are here because we want to be with you. And so may the words from Scripture penetrate our hearts today and let Jesus shine out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I was uh, at my last church, a friend of mine came and he was preaching, and uh, he asked a question, and I was thinking about the question. The question was simply, when was the last time you heard God speaking to you? And I don't know if there, sometimes there are just questions that people pose at the right moment where it's just so timely. I couldn't remember the last time God spoke to me. I was just trying to really rack my brain. When was the last time? So I thought I'd pose that question to you today, <laughs> that you could uh, wrestle with me. I, was, I don't remember anything else he said the rest of the night because I was trying to think, when was the last time? I know in the Bible there's people like Abraham who went years in between when God spoke to them, but uh, I don't think it always is that way. Sometimes we've got experiences in our lives where you just know that God was the one who spoke and told you and gave you the guidance you needed. But there are other times where if we reflect, we think, man, it's been a while, right? If we're truly being honest, that sometimes you might say, well, God spoke to me this morning in that you know, quiet time. But then you might say, well, you know what? I don't know. When was the last time? God spoke to you. I was wrestling with that question all the whole time during that meeting while he was speaking. I don't know what he talked about, but um, it must have been good. People enjoyed it. People came back the next night for, uh, for the series, and uh, it was as I was driving home, it was dark outside, and I was kind of praying in my mind, said, Lord, when was the last time? And he kind of got my attention. He said, well, I've been speaking to you all night, <laughs> right? It was just that realization that sometimes it's just that timely question that gets us to think and to know that when, it's, when it comes to God, he's always speaking something to us. When Jesus was ready to leave, he was telling the disciples the last things that he, he could say, and he still had more to say that he wasn't able to share with them. And as Jesus would die, the disciples would realize that all that time that they had been with Jesus was over. He would never be able to communicate with them. He would never be able to utter a word of encouragement to them. And Jesus was really trying to tell them that that was not going to be the case. In fact, if you look in John chapter 16, this is the third section of Jesus' farewell address. In John chapter 16 and verse 20, Jesus tells them, I'm going away, but this is what it's going to be like for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. The world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. As they see Jesus hang on the cross and die, they know and we know all too well what it's like to lose someone to death. It's a painful reality that we live in. We know what it's like. We know the pain of separation, of not being able to see that person or talk to that person or interact with that person, of knowing that person is just gone. But compound that with the idea that the person who just died was supposed to be the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Deliverer. Imagine somebody as close as Jesus and the disciples. Jesus says, you will be sorrowful. We can understand why that was the case. But then he also says your sorrow will be turned into joy because Jesus would appear to them after his resurrection. And they would realize that that would be a joy that would not be taken away. Jesus goes into an analogy and he says when a woman is giving birth, this is verse 21, she has sorrow because her hour has come. 
But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Just like when a baby is born, the mother forgets the pain of labor, Jesus says when he is back with the disciples, they're going to forget the sorrow. They're going to forget the anguish of soul that they had. And so he says in verse 22, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus says, I'll see you again. And I think about this statement of Jesus of how he's going to take sorrow and turn it to joy by reappearing and coming back to life and giving them this great promise of joy and hope and and assurance that he is truly the Messiah. But you also have to remember that after Jesus resurrected, he ascended back to heaven. And he left. That sorrow could have returned, right? Right? If we're honest, when you have somebody that you love dearly that goes away on a long trip never to see them again, aren't you a little bit sad to see them go? You're sad to see your kids go to kindergarten, (laughs) let alone move out to go to college, or join uh, a missionary society and go across to another part of the world. In our day and age, it's a lot easier to travel but there were times where people left and you never will see them, you never would see them again. I think of what Jesus says, yes, they have joy that he's come back, but what about when he leaves again? They wouldn't be able to talk with him, they wouldn't be able to interact with him. And Jesus is actually telling us that that's not entirely the case. Just because he's a great distance away in heaven does not mean that he has no access to speak. In fact, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to fill the void in his absence. I want to take you on a little journey through uh, what we've already talked about, about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 and 15, before jumping into chapter 16, because the Holy Spirit is mentioned more in these three chapters of John than in anywhere else in the gospel, and it is central to what Jesus had to say before he left. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Notice what Jesus says when he talks about the Holy Spirit. He says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you, how long? Forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him, for he will dwell with you and be in you. You see, Christ was leaving the world, but he knew that the disciples were not going to be left alone, and so he told them, I'm going to send Holy Spirit to you. He will be with you. He'll be in you. He will be the presence of Jesus, the voice of Jesus in your life as Jesus is gone. And not only that, but he is called the helper. And in here in John chapter 14, this first mention of the Holy Spirit, we see his role as a teacher, as somebody who will tell us the lessons of Jesus, somebody who will bring back to our memory what Jesus said when we need it the most. Have you ever had a word or a thought or an idea just pop into your mind at the right moment for the right time? That's the Holy Spirit at work. And so the the Holy Spirit works to teach the disciples to better understand the teachings of Jesus, to clarify maybe some of the meanings of the lessons that Jesus had to speak, to bring back to their memory things that they might have forgotten. And so the Holy Spirit acts as a teacher in here. If you look a bit further on in John chapter... 15. You know, I might have missed, marked this in my notes, but um, this is chapter 14. No, no, 15, 26, and 27. When the Helper comes, he will send to you, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. You also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. In John chapter 14, we see he is a teacher. In John chapter 15, we see that he is a helper. The problem with having notes is that it's easy to get them backwards. 
John chapter 14, I will be with you forever. As, they, as their hearts were leaving, as their hearts were going to be sad that Jesus was leaving, Jesus promises his presence. He promises comfort that the sorrow of the moment, the experience of sadness of his departure would be met with joy because they're not going to be cut off from him. They're going to have an uninterrupted flow to be able to dialogue with Jesus, to be able to talk with God in heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit that was in them. Jesus wasn't gone. His physical body may have ascended into heaven, but he remains here with the disciples. He will be with you forever, Jesus says. He was leaving the world, but he was giving them the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, 25 and 26, this is where Jesus says the Holy Spirit is like a teacher who will bring things back into your mind to help you remember. We talked about these a few weeks ago, if you remember, that the Holy Spirit does the work of leading us into the Scriptures, of understanding the Bible better. That's His job. You can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help you with difficult things in Scripture, and He will because that's what He specializes in. In John chapter 15, 26 and 27, it says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit helps in the witness of the church to bear witness of Jesus. He says, you will bear witness of me and the Holy Spirit will do that work through you. As you go out and share Christ, as you share the blessings that God has given you, you are promised the aid and the help of the Holy Spirit, which is really amazing because we need that, right? A lot of times we say things and the words fall flat, or our best intentions are misconstrued and people take offense, but when we have the help of the Holy Spirit, we are promised that He will bear witness, and His witness is the best witness. As we bear witness, we are told in chapter 16, the first few verses, that persecution would be the result and the Holy Spirit would remind us that Jesus said we'd be persecuted oh yeah I should expect this that's what the Holy Spirit does that's his job he is a teacher he's a helper he's a comforter and you'll notice in John chapter 16 where we look at now verse 7 Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit again and he says nevertheless I tell you the truth it is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And you look at the Bible, you see the Holy Spirit here has a specific job. I might call him a counselor, but if you pick a different adjective, that's fine. And you'll see that his job here is, the, the Bible uses the word convict, right? When you have conviction, what does that mean? I hear many different answers. Conviction is that a realization that something is not right. Isn't that true? That something needs to change. And if you look here, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, or you could say of the concept of sin, of righteousness and judgment, because our ideas of right and wrong and where we stand before God are completely wrong without the aid of the Holy Spirit. You think of sin, people's tolerance for sin in this world without the Holy Spirit is whatever, it, whatever works for them, right? You think of uh, what's good for you is not good for me, what's bad for you might be okay for me. That's the world we live in. Everybody has their own definition. And the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world of our false conceptions of sin. But not only that, our false conceptions of what is right, what righteousness is, what is good. Do you know uh, the story of the rich young ruler in the Bible? He came to Jesus and said, good master, what shall I do to be saved? And what did Jesus say? You've got the wrong idea about what is good. No one is good but God. We think we know what's right, but sometimes the Bible says to us, not sometimes, there's a way that seems right to man, but the ways thereof end in death. You know, what we think is right sometimes is not really what's right. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to tell us what is right. As we read the Bible, as we study Scripture, it's His job to tell us what we should be doing, how we should live. 
it's not your parents' job to tell you as an adult how you should live. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not even the church's job to tell you how to live. It's God's job. You can say amen to that. All right, I'll take that. There's a little bit of a nuance in that word convict, though. It doesn't always mean convict in the sense that we think, you know, something is wrong and it has to change. But there is also the nuance that it's convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because of our failure to believe in Jesus. Of righteousness because Jesus was going to the Father and he had no sin. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convince us that Jesus was truly righteous. That he had no sin. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is cast out and Jesus was going to take his rightful place as the judge. You see, all of those things in this sense are things that Jesus was already doing. He was already trying to convince them the world of their sin, of their lack of belief. You look at the text on the screen, I'm not going to read them all for you, but you, you can see that Jesus was pointing out the sin of unbelief and the sins of the people and the Pharisees. He was already doing that work and the Holy Spirit's job was to convince people in a continuation of this very thing that Jesus had already started. They didn't believe. Jesus wants that point to be driven home because we need to know where we stand, where we are. We need to know the starting place and we can be convinced that we are still sinners because the Holy Spirit is working in the same way that Jesus was working. You can look at how the Holy Spirit convinces of righteousness because Jesus was also trying to convince people of his own righteousness, of his own innocence before God, of his own sinlessness. And the Holy Spirit would continue that work to say, yes, Jesus truly was the only one who was righteous, the only one who stood before God without sin. And he can continue that work today to show that Jesus was the sinless one. And of course, we know that Jesus was working to convince the world that judgment was coming. That we do have to be responsible for our own actions. And Jesus over and over in the Gospel of John said, I didn't come to condemn. But when you refuse to believe, you condemn yourself. Jesus never uttered the words, I condemn you. But he did make the point that if you reject him, you condemn yourself. And the Holy Spirit works in this vein too to show people Jesus. The Holy Spirit magnifies the work of Christ. He lifts up Christ so that when we see Christ, we can be changed. We can be convicted of our sin. We can be convinced of Jesus' sinlessness. We can be convicted of the lack of our own righteousness, but we can also be convinced of Christ's perfect righteousness. We can be convicted that we are not standing right before God just because we think we're good people. But we can be convinced that Jesus stood righteous before God. And through his righteousness, we can be saved. The job of the Holy Spirit that Jesus says is to magnify the work of Christ. To show people that he is still saving. That he's not done yet. And because he's not done yet, we go to the second thing that Jesus says about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, in verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. See, the Holy Spirit is not limited to only sharing a certain thing. He can take whatever God has for you and show it to you at any time, even things that are still to come. The Holy Spirit deepens and unfolds the work and the ministry of Jesus. He shows us what Christ is doing, and he speaks the words that Jesus has for you directly to your ear. Think about the sadness that it would be for us today to say that God doesn't speak to anybody anymore because he's gone. That should be a 
pretty concerning statement, pretty concerning idea that we're here alone until he comes back for us. We'll never hear from him again. But that's not the case because the Bible says the Holy Spirit is here to speak. He's here to speak the lessons that Christ has yet to reveal. He's here to reveal the Word of God and the lessons that have already been shared by Christ. He's here to glorify Jesus by speaking His words to us. To magnify and to lift up the work of Christ. When was the last time you heard God speaking to you? You don't have to wonder. You do have to listen. God speaks to us in different ways. Perhaps you've seen him speak to you in various ways in the past, but he's revealed himself in theophanies through information that is given. He reveals himself through prophets and dreams and scripture and visions. The Bible also shows that God has revealed himself in the histories of the Old Testament and and the lessons that the prophets drew from those histories, the events of nature or events that happen around us. God speaks through all of these things and in many more ways he's not limited I like what Hebrews chapter 1 says, and maybe you know this, but a long time ago and in many different ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us by his son. God speaks in many different ways, but our job is to just recognize who is the one speaking. And that, I think, is perhaps the most difficult part that Christians have to wrestle with is that we're not just reading our Bible to say that we can check off a list. We're actually there to read and to learn and to grow, but also to hear what God wants to say. And if we forget that, if we fail to listen, we're missing the biggest piece of the whole puzzle. Not what I want to say to God that really matters. I mean, we pray and we should pray, but what does God want to say to me? That's the question. That's the question that we should wrestle with every single day. God, what do you want to say to me? Because God still speaks through the Holy Spirit. God has words for you. And if we open our hearts and we listen, we will find that Jesus still speaks, even now. I want to challenge you today to let the Holy Spirit be your comforter, your teacher, your helper, your counselor, your guide. Listen to his words. And it is as we do that, we find Christ will be glorified in us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our desire today is to hear your words. We know that you're speaking. We believe that you are because you said you would still speak to us today. But we pray that we would not be so hurried, we would not rush off before we have given an opportunity for you to address us. There are times when we feel that maybe you have been silent. We pray for faith and strength and sustain the sustaining power that you give to hold us during those times. But we trust that because we open up the space for you, that you have access to us, that we will hear your voice. We will know your word, and we will draw close to you because you have promised that you would speak. Thank you for this promise. We look forward to hearing from you often. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing our closing hymn, number 264. Oh, for that flame of living fire. If you could please stand for our closing hymn, and we'll sing the first, the fourth, and the fifth verses.
Father in heaven, we ask that you would pour out the Holy Spirit upon us. And as we go receiving the Spirit, we pray that the blessing of the Spirit would be not only on us, but on those that we meet and interact with. That those would see the uplifting of Jesus in our lives, and that your Spirit would show you as powerful to save, even those who are resistant and those who find it difficult. May you be the one that convicts and convinces, because that is your job. And we simply want to be open to you using us in any way you see, as we hear you and share you. In Jesus' name, amen.